Hello, everybody, and welcome to this podcast, which is designed to complement a special issue of the new review of Film and Television Studies, which focuses on the director, Catherine Bigelow. I'm Carl Sweeney, one of the contributors to the issue, and I'm very pleased to be hosting this discussion uh, about Bigelow, but more specifically about her 1987 film, Near Dark. And given that this podcast is covering Near Dark, who better to join me than someone who has actually written a book about the film uh, for the BFI Film Classics series, so yeah, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Stacey Abbott. Hi, Stacey. Hi, Carl. Thanks for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And uh, just by way of an introduction for, uh, for listeners, so, and Stacey, jump in if any of this information is inaccurate, out of date, etc. Thank you. Uh, so Stacey is reader in film and television studies at the University of Roehampton. Uh, so her book on Near Dark was released in 2020. Her other publications include a recent edited collection on global TV horror, uh, co-edited with Lorna Jowett. Has that one just recently been released? Yeah, it came out in March, so you're very up to date. <laughs> yep, because we record as we speak here, it's the beginning of May, so that's great. Um, so in general, Stacey, your research focuses upon gothic and horror genres in film and TV, with a particular focus on uh, zombies and vampires, is that about right? That's a fair description, yes. That's a fair description of my professional obsessions. <laughs> obsessions, I like it. Um <laughs> I suppose the obvious question is, hopefully there's kind of a cool origin story or something behind that. Um, on vampires in particular, is there a particular film or book or television series that really launched this obsession? It's kind of, it did actually happen sort of gradually. I've always been really interested in the horror genre. Um, so growing up, I was very familiar with Dracula, Browning's Dracula, and other, I would always argue that Scooby-Doo was very important to any young horror scholar <laughs> of my generation, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I suppose the, the, the text that really got me interested in, in vampires more specifically um, was probably George Romero's Martin, which I saw when I was about 17 or 18 as I was going through a kind of 70s horror phase and really interested in that and I just loved that film and it's kind of reinvention of the vampire genre uh, it's stripping away of the vampire conventions um, and then like many people in the 80s and 90s I started reading Anne Rice uh, and again, I really like this kind of reinvention so it's not surprising I'm drawn to I was very drawn to these texts that seem to know the origins of vampire mythology, but offer a kind of re reinvention. So Anne Rice was definitely a, a kind of figure, particularly in the late 80s. I kind of came to her a little bit later um, after Lestat was published in the 80s. And so I watched, I read Interview of the Vampire and Vampire Lestat very close together. Um, some, some of those things will stand us in good stead to talk about Near Dark, I yeah. think. Um, I'm much more of a layman on the issue of vampire uh, film and tv series oh, it, was, it was interesting going through your book because it was kind of like for me it was like well i've seen that one i haven't seen that one i've heard of this but i haven't seen that but just as a very general question for you i mean why do you think they are so prevalent in pop culture still because it, it seems that way but so i think when i was growing up it was buffy the vampire slayer but then since then twilight true blood new adaptations yeah. of dracula so on and so forth why do you think that might be well, I mean, yes. I mean, vampires are um, not surprisingly et timeless and eternal. Um, and I think there's a great author, a uh, scholar from the States who sadly passed away, Nina Auerbach, once said, you know, there's a vampire for every generation. And I think there's something about the vampire. I think there's multiple reasons why they're, they are perennial. One is that they do go through, you know, they, they are very adaptable to reinvention. You know, that yes, they have certain codes and conventions that not the well, they're not always consistent, but often recur. But that there's something about them that they are they're immortal, so they somehow adapt to the world they're in. So they become very um useful metaphors or useful tools to explore different ideas. Now, I think another one of the key reasons why they're prevalent is because they have for a long time been associated with sexuality. Um, sexuality as modern as we are and as progressive as we are will always be a subject that preoccupies us and particularly with various different taboos or issues. And the vampire becomes a really useful useful tool to explore that, whether that's Victorian um, anxieties or uh, issues around sexuality and female sexuality, you know, at the end of the 19th century, or whether it's 21st century anxiety about teenage sexuality, which we see in Twilight, you know, yeah. it's, uh, that's a recurring theme that comes up quite a bit. Um, they're also really preoccupied with borders with, you know, whether it's literally like anxieties about immigration and people crossing borders, vampires travel 
they bring with them their or they they yeah they bring with them their kind of the threat of contamination so they they tie into those they they are they embody the other they embody this idea of whatever we're afraid of they become a really good repository for what we're afraid of um or what we're attracted to and i think Uh, that's the other thing is it's not just that they you know and we see that particularly now is often it's less about us being afraid of vampires and more about the allure of them so they also embody this kind of that kind of relationship between attraction and repulsion so they're very malleable. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. So I think I was looking at one of your articles yesterday. I believe it was about TV adaptations of Dracula. And I right. think there was a line in there which jumped out at me, which was there is a fundamental synergy between the vampire and cinema. So I'm guessing there's some of that to do with things like visual effects, perhaps. Or... Uh, yes, no, absolutely. Uh, and because one of the things that when I first started getting into writing about vampires, beyond just my interest in kind of um, watching the films, reading the books, is that... Dracula was written in 1897, or no, I should say, Dracula was published in 1897, obviously written but for about seven years up until that point. Um, and obviously, the, you know, we have the birth of cinema is, is, you know, located in 1895. So there is a synergy, a temporal synergy to Dracula being this really key uber text. Yeah. You know, it's not the first, but it's obviously pivotal coming on to the, the, the world stage, as it were, at the time we have the birth of cinema. So they're sort of happening together. And cinema does start adapting. It takes a little while, but you start seeing this adaption, adaptation of, Dra- of Dracula and then other vampire texts. And I think, so there is, there is a kind of temporal synergy, um, but there's also something about cinema that is, there is something about it kind of trapping souls in this, in this, cycle of repetition you know that you know you can when you're kind of capturing particularly in the early days of cinema you know there was this image of looking at these faces recorded and these little snapshots of movement and there's an uncanniness to cinema that they are kind of forever eternally young and try and, and I, so i think there is a kind of te- there's a synergy there and then as you say there's a syn- there's a relationship to special effects the ways in which the technology of cinema allows um, the imagine the imagination around the vampire to be visualized in really interesting ways. You know, cinema had to find a face and an appearance and a kind of conception of the vampire that was imagined in literature. Um, and obviously, there's also you know I don't want to dismiss stage versions as well. That's also an important area um, where you also have kind of playing with special effects and trick effects that begin to get adopted into cinema. It's interesting in relation to Near Dark, isn't it? Because I believe they had things like prosthetics built onto the actors' faces for when they need to burn up and that kind of thing. Absolutely. They had to do lots of, and again, because it was a very um, low budget film, they had to do those really kind of clever practical effects. If I remember correctly, um, one of the sequences when someone's turning into a vampire and he's walking, Caleb, when he's walking out in the desert and he begins to burn up and all you, what you get is him covered in smoke. I think he had this sort of had his, under his clothes, these traps of like these, what were like cigars underneath his clothes, gradually burning. He said he smelled like he'd been in a pool room because um, yeah. he was just reeking from the smell of smoke having to come out uh, from his clothes at certain moments so that he would look like he was, you know, burning, slowly burning. Okay, so let's um, hone in a bit on on Near Dark. And I'm not going to give a spoiler warning for a film from 1987, but I will say, <laughs> listeners, if you haven't seen it, maybe pause the podcast, go and watch it, and then come yeah. back. Might be a decent <laughs> idea. Can you recall seeing this film for the first time, Stacey? Yes, I do. Well, there are two first times, in a sense. Um, I was aware of the film when it, when it was... I, I didn't see it in the cinema, sadly. I was aware when it was on video. In the late 80s, I worked in a video store, so I was vaguely aware of it, but I'd never watched it. But when I was at university, I had a job in the audiovisual department in my university in Montreal. And my boss said, if you like Anne Rice, you know what you need to do is see this film. And I had never seen it. And she had a copy of it. And she showed me one scene to hook me. And it was the barroom mm. slaughterhouse scene. And she said, you know, you have to see this. And I saw that. So that was my first experience in Near Dark was seeing that scene out of context, had no idea what I was looking at and went, OK, I now need to go find this film and watch this on my own. So I then went off and watched um, the crummy video that you could get at that point. <laughs> Um, so I have, was really remembered as having this really 
major impact on me um, and just being mesmerized by this film. For me, it was much more recently. Um, this was actually the, the final Catherine Bigelow film I saw. I'd seen all of her other films first because there was a, a conference in 2019 at the University of Wolverhampton. Actually, actually have a lighthouse cinema, which is right next to the university. Um, focusing on Bigelow, I wanted to submit something for it. Uh, this is the conference that has led to this special issue that's coming out. I actually found the film quite hard to track down. I don't know if it was just that the places I was looking for the film on DVD were out of stock, but it took me a while. I think I bought a secondhand copy. Yeah. With Bigelow, it's interesting because obviously the idea of what constitutes, quote unquote, a Catherine Bigelow film is quite flexible, isn't it? So I yeah. don't think any of her other films had really prepared me for this one. But yeah, I admired it a lot on first viewing. I didn't know anything about it going in other than that it was a some kind of hybrid vampire western at its most simple level, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, I thought it was a very rich film. It's very seductive, but also very savage. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't I don't think I realized how rich it was, and this is not just a flat you, but until I read your book more recently, how much was going on here. So mm. yeah, what I suppose what made you want to focus on it as a book for the BFI Film Classic series? It's a great series, isn't it? Because it's um, yeah. expansive enough to include a lot of the films you'd sort of expect to be there, but also something like Near Dark, is it fair to say a bit more niche cult, I suppose? Definitely more niche and cult. Um, Obviously I had written about it, the film, when I was writing my PhD thesis on vampire films. So, you know, it's been a film that's preoccupied me for quite a while. Like it's, you know, it pops up, I teach it in uh, at university. Um, So it's something I've always, I've often worked with, but I, I, you know, I've long been an admirer of the BFI classic series. I really like, like you said, that mix of texts you get, things that are classics, things that maybe are obviously classics or might not fit into more traditional conceptions of classics. And I suppose I've, so I I had long aspired to this and I suppose wanting to write a BFI classic on Near Dark because I think it has, um, it really captures that mix of something which I think is in some respects, perfect for that series because it's aesthetically rich and one of the beauties of this particular series of books is the fact that it really focuses in on close analysis it really wants you to revel in the text and this is a a a film that really is very rich aesthetically as well as narratively and i always thought that would work really well and um on on a very practical element they really welcome using lots of images in these books they Mm. really want that kind of close look and and again i always thought this film would work really well um but i also like the fact that it's not a traditional classic you know it's a it's by a woman and while there are films in the series by women um in the classic series still you know still and i'm sure and i know the bfi and bloomsbury would say this not enough yet like they're very aware that you know they're, they want to, that's, that's a situation they want to change. But it's about woman milk, filmmaker um, one. I was surprised when I proposed it at that point um, that there weren't any of her other films weren't included in the series. I was really surprised because mm-hmm. I thought there must, Blue Steel must be in there or, or Strange Date. Like, you know, I was just thought yeah. something or Point Break. Yeah. Um, so I was very surprised by that. So it always just felt like a really Good. And then when I realized there weren't any in there, I said, well, okay, the first one that goes in that series should be near dark, you know, and I just felt, no, actually, that was that was the final push to kind of propose it. I said, no, because I think this is a film that lays out so much of what makes her an exciting filmmaker is right there from the start. Like you said, it's not you can't, as you say, you can't quite just simplistically characterize a Bigelow film, but there are lots of things that she does really well that I think we see beautifully you know present in near dark um so i really like that i like the idea that it is in some respects cl- wonderfully classic it's also wonderfully transgressive and culty and i i like that for the series and i was so i was delighted when they wanted to do it so what was that process like of um i, I don't know how you put it like living with the film as you were writing the book so i just imagine it involves a lot of repeat viewings and yes how, how was that that was I mean it's a great I have to say it was a, it was a delight it's probably been one of the most pleasurable experiences of writing a book and actually I haven't really had negative experience of writing a book but it really was nice um as I said I've been teaching the film for many years so this is a film I already have a, a real very close knowledge of um but once you start doing this and once I'd kind of laid out the structure of the book then it is repeat viewing and then breaking down the film I and mean, one of the things I I didn't want to do um, as a personal writing choice, some of the some of the books are often written where they just they take you through s- scene by scene the film yeah, yeah. and tell you 
interesting things about them. And that is one approach to do it. And it, it can work really well. It wasn't how I wanted to do it. So for me, it was about working out the kind of thematic, the kind of approaches I wanted to take to the film. What I thought were the key scenes that do fit into it. And, and for the most part, I do go through the film kind of chronologically, but through the lens of different yeah. kind of themes. So it was kind of working through and then spending a lot of time watching, rewatching, going back. <laughs> um, lots of notes, lots of notes. I'm very old school. So it's a lot of like handwritten. I just sit and just take lots of handwritten notes. But it was a real pleasure. Um, and then also the other thing I did as I was going through, um, I mean, the, fra the images in the book were done by a professional. They're beautifully done. But I did a lot of frame grabs as I was watching it because I would watch it on my laptop. And just if I saw an image that I just really liked, I would just pause it, take an image. So I could always go back to the image as I was writing um, as to help me kind yeah. of talk about it. How many times do you think you've seen this film then, just out of interest? Could you could you put a number on it? Um, oh, honestly, I mean, I've been teaching it for years. So even just once a year for that class would be like 15 times alone for that, let alone. So I would say somewhere over 30, 40 times, maybe more. Like I really couldn't begin. Obviously, I've written it up for my PhD. Yeah, yeah. I've shown it to people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, yeah, so I would say at a, at a rough guess, somewhere around 30, 40 times. Before we come to some of the ideas that are in the various chapters of the book, I was just wondering about how do you feel this um, film in particular fits in sort of Bigelow's body of work and sort of where was she in her career at this sort of point in time? Well, this is, you know, is is very early in her career. So it's her first solo directed film. So as I'm sure you know, you know, she had made The Loveless um, previously co-directed with Monty Montgomery. Um, and that and which and that itself is a very classic Bigelow film in many respects. But prior to making moving into this type of filmmaking, she had come from an, a, a visual art background, painter, etc. And and I think with The Loveless, you see that tradition really coming out in yeah. her work you know it is very painterly I mean I think it's in many respects all of her films are painterly in their own way but you really see that visual tradition it's sort of a, it's often described as being a hybrid of Douglas Sirk and Kenneth Anger you know so you're seeing that kind of artistic tradition and I think Near Dark is part of her that move for her into to mainstream filmmaking of wanting to move more into that she had had a couple of years of what they would describe as development hell of trying to get films off the ground and not getting them off the ground. She was a, she taught film studies at Cal art, I think, you know, so she was, and, and where she, and I was always interesting that when she was teaching, she was teaching B movies, American B movies. So you can see that this film is, she's starting to think more about a career in filmmaking and wanting to work in mainstream and then these kind of B movies. And so she um, basically decides to write a script to try to get this made both as a successful script writer, but with her attached to it as a director. And she co-wrote co -wrote it with Eric Red. Um, and they kind of agreed that they would try to help each other get their first directorial gigs by working together. And this was the, the beginning. So I think it's a really key thing that marks her shift into overt i mean overtly engaging with genre and a more yeah. in a more mainstream in a mainstream way and i'm not remotely using mainstream in a negative way but just in a kind of wanting to move into hollywood yeah. and work in that side of the industry yeah because the loveless is like a biker film but it's very much an art house <laughs> it's film, very it? art house very slow i mean considering when you think of it again and i say it again in a non-judgmental way it's designed yeah. to be very slow it's a lot of people you know you get this biker gang turns up in town and and not a lot happens it's all a lot of meaningful stares and glances and looks and um it's beautiful um but it's a very art house whereas here you know she's embracing vi her kind of visceral kinetic energy that she would become associated with yeah because this is before blue steel and point break and so on yeah, yeah. And I think her student film is called The Setup, and that's yes. it's about violence, but it's about the sort of philosophical nature of violence, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually pulled up a quote from her from a 1995 interview. She talks about how she became dissatisfied with the art world, um, specifically the fact that it requires a certain amount of knowledge to appreciate abstract material. Film, of course, does not demand this kind of knowledge. Uh, film was this incredible social tool, tool that required nothing of you uh, besides 20 minutes to two hours of your time. 
mm-hmm. which I think is a nice way to put it. Um, so if this film, it, oh, so, so relatively early in her career, and on release, kind of some interesting stuff there. So not a big box office hit at all, was it? Not at all. <laughs> not yeah. at all. I mean, it suffered even before it came out because um, the company that made it went bankrupt. They sold the rights to De Laurentiis, who then went bankrupt. <laughs> like, it struggled. It played in the cinemas, in the U.S. cinemas for three weeks. Um and made, I double checked the figures because I'm bad with numbers. It made three, just over $3 million, <laughs> just over $3 million. And it was made for a $5 million budget. So, you know, this film came and went. Um, almost, I mean, I'd be interested to know who saw this film on release because <laughs> yeah. most people I know who are really fans of these kinds of films that love this film came to it later. Um, so it kind of just, it just disappeared. Um, it was a little indie film that got lost. And it was released in Halloween. While it is a vampire film, it is a horror film. It's not a typical yeah. kind of Halloween release. And it also suffered for coming out, what, two, three months after The Lost Boys, um, which was a huge summer blockbuster success. So I just think it just disappeared. It was invisible. Even though it sounds like it was received pretty well critically, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it was. Um, in fact, the majority of the reviews I looked at when I was researching it um, were, at best, hugely praised it so, and, and really recognized her as a director to watch. She gets, you know, most of the reviews comment on her, on her genre hybridity. a lot, And then they comment on the things that she would become forever associated with, genre hybridity, kinetic energy, violence, you know, that um they they really i pick up on that and they recognize there's something really fresh reworking of genre there are some negative reviews some people in fact didn't like it precisely for the reasons others did they didn't like the genre hybridity or they thought it was too violent Mm. um there are some wonderful quotes of people sort of saying i came out desperate for a bambi movie and you know (laughs) stuff like that um you know but for the most part it did really well and then six months roughly about six months after it you know, was technically released the cinema. It got a, a screening at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, which did a lot for its, her reputation and the film's reputation, um, because there was a recognition of again her as a new voice of cinema. So I think that also ties into reception. It didn't help the film make any money, but yeah. it it I think it helped it not get lost in the shuffle. You know. Yeah, and then that process of video finding an audience through video and later yeah. dvd and so on absolutely yeah. yeah so you mentioned um and i think we both mentioned her uh, bigelow's tendency to sort of blend genres mm-hmm. very relevant to this film yeah just relevant in general to her isn't it because i think a lot of people discuss her as like an action director but that doesn't really cut it as a description does it because she moves between genres so often yeah she does i mean i think she she moves between genres from film to film like, I, I just think, you know, she's not yeah. someone, you know, I would love to see her do another horror movie and she's never gone back to doing anything like this again. Um, so she's done, quote unquote, you know, vampire films and police thrillers and surfing movies and science fiction. And, you know, so she moves between genres, but she also each each of those films, it's it's limiting to describe them only as one thing, like to describe Point Break as only a surfing movie. Yeah is just is not understanding what point break is you know it's action it's melodrama it's a love story you know um and the same with near dark you know that she she fuses genres together in really interesting ways so you always feel like you're seeing something quite new even if it's drawing upon familiar things that individually are familiar yeah even even to this day i think with her most recent film detroit um I just pulled out a quote from Mark Commode's review of the film where he says it shifts from social realism to courtroom drama via crime thriller, musical fantasy and social chiller. So just as an example. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And of course, she's been asked about this many times over the years. Uh, In a 1989 interview, she said that she tries to turn genre on its head or make an about face. And just when I make the audience a bit uncomfortable, I go back and reaffirm. Mm. Uh, And in another interview, she said that she has this desire to subvert and redefine and at times she seems to suggest it might be unconscious. She says it's not always um, strategically that she's cross-pollinating genres. Yeah. But it sounds like it is somewhat strategic here because in the commentary she says how she wanted to do a Western, 
Oh, her and Eric Red wanted to do a Western, but it wasn't as saleable as the horror film at the time. So that, that sounds strategic to me. Yeah, I think this one, it was um, definitely strategic as it was very much like, I want to make a Western song, I better pretend it's a vampire film, which again, if you think of by the mid 1980s, you know, you have huge success of Anne Rice novels, Le Vampire Lestat comes out in 1985, you've got Fright Night, you've got, you know, Monster Squad, there's a, there, so in a way, the, the idea of saying, I'm going to make a Western, but I'm going to make it as a vampire film makes complete sense in terms of what's selling at that point. Um, it's, you know, it's a few years before Unforgiven comes out in the early 90s and marks that moment of rejuvenation of the Western. So, you know, you, I completely think it, it's absolutely strategic. Yeah, she talks about how fun it was on the commentary to, I think she uses the phrase, it's something like access to the legacy of the Western. And she yeah. was a life, she's been, she's, you know, ridden horses all her life and that kind of thing. Yeah. So you get things like the standoff scene between Severin and Caleb, which yeah. is kind of true to Western convention in some ways but then obviously the truck turns up and yeah. the other characters are around yes uh, so it kind of speaks to that i think yeah absolutely um just in terms of that broader context of the 1980s and uh, uh vampire films and particularly american uh, vampire films so you mentioned a couple of titles like the lost boys so it, i think in the book you said it's kind of an americanization of yeah. the vampire film during this period is that right yeah i think so i think um that what you're seeing is because obviously vampire films have been going on forever and they're constantly in periods of recycling but in this period what you're seeing is um americanization in multiple ways one that it's often about this kind of relocating the vampire story in the U.S. You know, in they are reinvented, they are located in the U.S. And we see this with Martin in the 1970s, but at Hunger in the early 80s, you know, they, they keep coming about vampires coming to the U.S. But it also becomes, they increasingly, the vampire, it becomes about the vampires themselves are either American or they are embodying a kind of a, a style of America. Um, you know, so you have sort of teenage youths, you have the uh, Susan Sarandon in The Hunger, who is this kind of very modern American woman um, who stands in contrast to the European vampires like David played by Kathleen Deneuve and David Bowie, you know. So there's, there is that sense of reworking the genre um, in terms of the characterizations and then also by the hybridity of mixing them with other genres. I mean, so we're talking about Near Dark and we'll come back to her hybridity, but this is also a big trope of the 80s vampire film. More often than not, um, they become mixed with comedy and particularly teen comedy and adolescence with the Monster Squad, Fright Night, Lost Boys and many others. And is it generally the case then, it sounds like that um, a lot of those other films are more, I don't know how you'd put it, self-conscious, self-referential? Van, Van Near Dark is. Yes, they are. They tend to be set in worlds where all the characters know a vampire film when they've seen it. They've yeah. all know Dracula. They all know vampire films. They often talk about movies, Lost Boys. They talk about comics in Fright Night. One of the main characters is an actor who played a vampire hunter in movies. So they're very self-conscious and they're, they're interested in reworking conventions through kind of embracing them, you know. So we'll have our Van Helsing characters in Lost Boys, but there'll be two teenage to preteen boys who read lots of comics, you know, but they'll serve that Van Helsing role. Um, yeah. So they're very self-conscious, which obviously is a big difference with From Near Dark, which doesn't exist in a world where people, well, at least they don't seem to know what a vampire is. The word's never mentioned, is it, at no. all in, in the film? No, and that again was deliberate. That was very yeah. deliberate to say they don't say it. We're not going to. And Caleb at one point even asks, "What are we?" And May just says, "I don't know." Like you know, we don't know. Just this is what we are. Uh, but then again, on the commentary, Bigelow talks about how the idea of the transfusion, uh, transfusion, which comes in, um, she relates that back to Stoker's Dracula. Yes. So you've got this kind of mix, haven't you? Where it's kind of play into some of those standard conventions at times and de denying it at other times. Yes, absolutely. I mean, she knows, and she underplays her knowledge of it because she says, like, I knew Dracula. Yeah. And I think she, somewhere she also did reference Interview with the Vampire, like that she is, you know, she is, she is, so, she's familiar. But she, she, I think, underplays, as someone who we know is, a, is, a, is very knowledgeable at cinema, I suspect she knows more than she lets on. But I yeah. think she, so I think she, but she makes, she picks and chooses what she is going to kind of, drawn and and the transfusion is a great one because it, in a way it's very classically it's you know it's, it's part of dracula it's a big part of that narrative she uses it differently and 
but also it's one that doesn't always get adapted, definitely doesn't feature in um, vampire films that aren't based on Dracula, like, you know, and even Dracula films don't often have, don't always have the transfusion. Um, but it's, you know, it's just, she's also at a time when other films weren't doing that, she's bringing that back in, in a very interesting way. And, and again, in decidedly in a, in quite an original way, because it's, well, spoilers, it's more successful in her film than it is in Dracula, where it never works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, she says how she talks about how the vampire mythology uh, brought a beautiful complication to things. Um, and I think when she talks, she talks on the commentary a bit about some of the things that aren't in the film. So I guess she's, I think she mentions garlic specifically, yeah. but you know, crosses and so on. Yeah. Um, she talks about it didn't have an ironic approach to the material. What's interesting is she links it to the idea of a duality in a way that she found very appealing. Like for instance, there's, a, there's that early scene with Caleb and May mm. is when she's talking about starlight yeah, and like I suppose from his perspective, he thinks she's being kind of dreamy and you know kind of kind of ethereal and otherworldly, yeah. but she actually isn't. She, she's kind of being quite literal. Yeah. Um. But all she, all through the film, really, like the the shootout scene in the uh, the hotel room, I think, yes. it is, where um the police assume that the bullets are what's going to be harmful to, to these characters. That's not the case, really. But but yeah. the sunlight that they're bringing in is so. Yes. You get lots of nice complications, don't you? I think. Yeah, and and again, this is where she, because she thinks so well visually, she's constantly thinking about playing with those ideas. And you know, again, I think that's one of my favorite examples of that hybridity that she brings in. And she's not just like, I'm going to throw in a west, a cowboy, and a vampire, but she's saying, no, I'm going to have a shootout. And what would you know? How do I? How do I even the, the scales between a human and a vampire in this kind of thing? It's going to be the light. So you get those wonderful, you know, pivotal, like little streams of light, you know, piercing the room. And it feels very violent. Like you, they do, the light does pierce the room in the same way the bullets pierce the body. So there's really, there's wonderful complications of how we engage with these, these tropes that are very familiar, whether you're watching Westerns or vampire films. And suddenly they both feel really new and fresh by what she's doing it's one of my favorite scenes yeah she talks about how the more you believe in the reality of the rules of the game um the more you invest in it and i think an example would be like so these vampires if they're shot by a shotgun they that's not going to stop them but it is going to kind of hinder them slightly it's not yeah. it's not going to take them out but it <laughs> yeah they're impacted by these impacted, things yeah. you know and, and even like the sunlight like they burn <laughs> they yeah. do burn um and so they're slowed down they're affected you know Severin gets hit by a semi truck, you know, he is impacted by this, but that won't stop them. You know, they will keep coming. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They've got that kind of implacability. Yeah. About them. Absolutely. Um, so, as I said, Bigelow often sort of uh, summarized as an action director. Mm. And, and I think you say that Near Dark, it's a pivot point between notable mm. action vampire traditions. Yeah. I had never thought about this in relation to like the Hammer films, but you're sort of saying they were you know, a more active, dynamic Van Helsing. and Yeah, well, kind of if you thing. think when when Dracula, because Dracula is a novel, is it has a strong element of action to it because it has a huge chase sequence back from London to Transylvania. You have a character in there who is a Western character who carries a Winchester rifle. And so it has that very strong action element. But when it got adapted to Scream, um, initially most of the adaptations are based on the stage play. So Dracula became much more about these kinds of sitting room conversations, seductions, you know, and that element of the narrative really disappears or, or you know, gets fades away a bit. It just becomes less prevalent. Um, and I think Hammer, you know, Hammer really was interested in, in restoring that kind of action to it for their own aesthetic purposes so you get a young van helsing a comparatively young van helsing and a, and a young dracula and again you have their 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 dynamic they don't just sit around talking you know you get chase sequences and you do get the, the you get that big chase back to the castle and their confrontation is physical they fight um, and you know the classic moment when Van Helsing leaps across the room and rips down the curtains so that you get the sunlight streaming in. Like, so there's there's a real and you see this across a lot of that Hammer work that there's an emphasis on these very physical confrontations, which had it wasn't really part of it before that, or you know it was less important in earlier versions. So I think that's really key. And then you have that in later films, but you know if you look at something like. Martin, 
again, is a very, again, with Romero is a very slow, it has those kind of those moments. But again, it's trying to strip away some of that. The hunger is all about meaningful gazes and seduction. So it's less interested in those kinds of moments. Um, so this is a really important film. They're saying, no, actually, we're going to have chases and we're going to have, you know, they're constantly on the run. <laughs> they're constantly running and you know, being chased yeah. before you get in the 90s where you get now suddenly the you know vampire again becomes very much part of a kind of martial arts action yeah. approach with Buffy, Blade, Underworld and a lot of others. It becomes again very physical. So the sort of 1980s-ness of this is quite important then because we have, it seems like, half the cast of Aliens yes. in Near Dark. Uh, Lance Her- Henriksen, Jeanette Goldstein and Bill Paxton, all very memorable. Yep. I think a nod to Aliens at one point, I didn't notice this until you pointed it out in the book, but it's the cinema hoarding yeah. isn't it, in the yeah. background. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, that, like I said, implacable. So you, they've got some of that quality of the relentless opponent of mm. you know somebody like the Terminator, I suppose. Yeah. And um, they're, just, they're not clean and debonair you know so yeah how, how much is it fitting into those up in that 1980s kind of i think a vibe? lot of it is i think it's it's fitting in it's contributing to that and it's responding to to all of those tropes so yes you have they're very terminator like and another key film i would say because of eric red is the hitcher you know you have the who is a very similar human form of the terminator he just keeps coming so there is that sense um you move away from um, these vampires are being rethought now, as you said, they're always kind of burnt out and dirty. And there's a sense of stripping away again. So you think about the Terminator and the ways in which from the beginning to the end of the film, you know, the Terminator himself is literally stripped down to his exoskeleton. Yeah, yeah. And you see this repeatedly in this film, that sense. And there is a sense of, you know, wanting to make these, these films very visceral. There's a visceral quality to them um but the other thing i would say there's another part for me is a big part of that 80s um style is the course is the humor it's the implacableness the, the way in which they respond to it so yes they're kind of burning away and they are feeling it but they laugh it off or they crack jokes lots of puns lots of that kind of kind of 80s humor sort of deadpan humor amongst the violence which i think is is makes it very kind of characteristic of the period and Bill yeah. Paxton, especially, who is just having the best time ever in this film. Well, he apparently ad libbed the line, I hate it when they ain't been shaved, <laughs> which is in that, that bar house scene, isn't it? Yes. Um, apparently, the bar, that bar had to be built from scratch because it was obviously going to be destroyed. And uh, that was the most complicated sequence. Yeah. There's some interesting production stuff, isn't there? Because apparently the actors went through vampire boot camp. Yes. Um, so they had to, like, you know, Bigelow timed them blacking out the rooms and that kind of thing. Yeah, she wanted them to to work as a team and be able to work as a team. So she, yeah, did get them, sort of put them in a room, say, okay, you've got to black out all the windows of this car and we're going to time you. And here's like a bunch of things, paint, tinfoil, whatever you need, figure it out. And so I quite like that idea of working, you know, getting, of getting them to kind of train themselves yeah. into survival and how to, to rely on each other and work together, which I think works really well. Yeah, and apparently she took some of the actors to a gun range under supervision yeah. before filming only started. Yeah. Um, the one I'm uneasy about is the idea that Lance Henriksen, who plays Jesse in the film, he apparently went to pick up hitchhikers in preparation. And it sounds like quite in character. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. I I know. I've heard he tells numbers of those stories of him on the road. There's also a um, story of him driving. I can't remember where he lived at the time, but when he drove down to the shoot, he sort of drove down not fully in character, but he had been preparing, letting, you know, he had his nails done. And, you know, so he yeah. looked really, you know, intimidating. And there's some really great stories that are unsettling. And one story of him and, and, and Bill Paxton deciding to go you know, on a road trip after, you know, at the end of the day, going off to another town fully in costume and having an encounter with a police officer where you just, where they were caught speeding, where you just thought that is not smart. <laughs> that is not smart. Yeah. Um, but I think, but I think there was something about that shoot because it was done quite intensively. It was a race, you know, it was what, 47 days, 40 of 39 or 40 of which were night shoots. And, and they were all living, you know, that, all the location shooting, they were living in motels in the area where they were shooting. I think there was 
I think it fueled a little bit of that sort of just we're going to embrace who these characters are, um, particularly between Paxton and Henriksen, who I think you get a lot of just them wallowing in their testosterone uh, as they're kind of just <laughs> embracing their vamp- vampirism. Yeah. Even Jeanette Goldstein talks a bit about saying it was a bit like it was, she found it was a bit intense. It was great, but it was intense. And she says, I don't necessarily want to just live my character <laughs> all the time. So earlier you were saying about how maybe Bigelow underplays some of her knowledge. And I, I just thought it was interesting that in the book you quote from her, I think she had said that the film took away all the gothic aspects. Yeah. And you're saying that doesn't really tell the full story because it is actually achieving this cinematic gothic aesthetic. Yeah. So what do you think she means? She's referring to the class, the most overt aspects. I yeah, see. I think when she's using the term gothic, she's saying, you know, she says she's saying I've, she removes all the castles, graveyards, the garlic, the crucifixes, the religious iconography, and she's quite right. She does. You know, she's she's stripping all of that away, um, and and that's one way of thinking of the gothic. Uh, and I think that's where she, but I think what the film does is then replace that with a, a compl- very gothic aesthetic that is highly cinematic by saying it's all about the lighting. And I think she, she's very knowledgeable about that kind of expressionist style. Um, but she's, th- she's not, she's thinking of it in terms of tropes as opposed to kind of the lighting that she uses in this film. Yeah, so we get the collision of light and dark, don't we? So I'm yeah. sure if people have seen the film, they'll be able to summon up the image of the vampires on the hillside with the light um, from behind them. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, the shootout in the hotel room is yeah. about that duality as well between light yeah. and dark. She talks on the commentary about how, I think it's the earlier scene, the, the first few scenes of the film, she talks about how the locations they found outside Phoenix were interesting because they were both bleak and dramatic. So it's kind of an interesting yeah. uh, dynamic. And she spends a lot of time praising Adam Greenberg's cinematography. Yeah. You know, describes it as painterly. She said some of his compositions were like a muted Cezanne. So yeah. high praise. Absolutely. And Greenberg is really important part of the, of the team she pulls together for this film. You know, he had shot terminator he was used to working um, on a low budget film shooting at night shooting fast but creating really dynamic visuals and he had a real desire to make every shot look beautiful and one of the things that, that is interesting is that he recognized that as much as this is a film about violent nasty characters but you're you spend most of the film in their world so he wanted the film to look as beautiful as it does to them, like this is their landscape and it is dangerous, but it's also beautiful. Um, so he, and he does that, the, the lighting, even scenes like one of my favorite shots is when Caleb's just walking along the highway and you've got this sort of truck stop where um, drivers are cleaning or washing their trucks and all this. And the lighting there is stunning where you've got sort of this, this and it's a, like I said, it's a really mundane location. It's just a truck stops outside of a town but but be lit to really beautiful like breathtaking imagery um so she's trying to she wants to kind of capture and the two of them together try to capture the seduction of the nighttime landscape which is really important to a vampire narrative where that's part of the allure is you know yeah. this living this outlaw life at night and just in terms of the production so notable that so a film that's what 40 plus days yeah. and apparently a third of that was during what they call magic hour at a time yes. when the lights either yeah um coming or going yes <laughs> exactly yeah so it's a really tough shoot it's a tough shoot yeah. um because you have very restricted but it does create a, a beautiful landscape again there's something really magical about magic hour it's the reason why it's called that because it really does have that sort of twilight it's neither day nor night and yeah you know great place to make a set of vampire film and I think when people have seen the film, well, what they'll also remember is what they what they've heard um, because of Tangerine Dreams score, of course. Yeah. So that that kind of kind of timely and timeless because the synthesized score is quite appropriate to the period. Yeah. But I think the phrase uses diegetically timeless because it's not a score that kind of has associations with the backstory of these characters so anything like that yeah absolutely I, exactly I think there's something about it that doesn't feel like you're you know, beyond the the barroom scene where you do have diegetic ju- yeah. ju- a jukebox score for the most part that that tension is not trying to nod to um it doesn't make it 
narratively, it is not linked to 1980s Arizona or Oklahoma. Um, it's not, uh, like I said, because you because you have characters coming from different time periods. You could, you know, there's you could have scores that kind of reflect that. It's not. It's somehow. It, it again. It, it taps into that twilight space. There's something. It feels like you're in a slightly magical space and i think that it works really well sometimes it's very romantic i think the theme the may theme is very romantically very dreamy um whereas then you also have a very driving um uh intensive score that underpins a lot of the the action sequences a lot of the sequences on the road where you really feel them being propelled from location to location like you know you, they can't stop because if they stop they'll die yeah so you mentioned May's theme there, so perhaps we should talk a bit more about both May and Caleb. Maybe let's start with him. Yeah. So, so in the book you're saying he seems a face on, you know, ostensibly to be part of a specific tradition of sympathetic vampires. So that tradition, I mean, the first one that sprang to my mind was Angel. I remember in you know, in the early seasons of Buffy, yes. you didn't want to be a vampire, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is that the tradition? Is that that, that That's sort of a character? tradition. I mean, there's a tradition. It goes, I mean, you know, it's arguable how far it goes back there. You, know, you can always find different examples. Dracula's daughter from the 1930s was a sympathetic, reluctant vampire, just one who tries to find a cure. Um, Barnabas Collins on Dark Shadows from the 60s, you know, that there's a tradition. Um, and I think it particularly becomes prevalent in television because you have longer narratives. So these characters, these vampires have to have, they can't just be villains for, you know, two, 300 episodes or something. Yeah. It, it, there's no narrative, there's no story there. But so you create a kind of reluctant, sympathetic thing where they're struggling against who they are. And obviously Interview the Vampire has that as well. And again, I think that's where you can see that tying in here that she's tapping into that narrative of vampires who are brought into this and resisting it. And so Caleb does fit into that because he does spend um, a big chunk of the film being told you have to kill to survive. You have to do it. You have to do it. And he is resisting it. You know, he is, or is he, or is when push comes to shove, is incapable of doing it. You know, yeah. he's being told to do it and he tries, but he just can't bring himself. So he does in some respects fit into that tradition. Um, but I sort of argue that I don't think he completely fits into that tradition. Um, because if you compare it to so many of the other vampires we're talking about, is that one of the things he does is, or, or even if you compare him to Michael in The Lost Boys, who, is, who very similarly is half vampire, he's turning, he's being pushed to make the transformation, he doesn't. The difference is Caleb does drink blood in this film. Mm -hmm. He has no problem drinking blood. And, and, and has no problem and eventually starts to kind of, and he kind of likes the world. He can't bring himself to kill. But if he's drinking blood that May is killed for and drinking from her, he's okay with that, which is, is different because somehow that's not, that's, and I think that's why I quite like it. I think he's, he, on the one hand, a lot of people think of this as being, well, it's his story and he's, he's so sympathetic. And I go, well, actually, is he? Like he is, I don't, I find him quite, I love the character, but I find him quite, unpleasant in places or at least you're going well he's quite dark in yeah. this in some of their scenes where i just think well, no, you are you are not as sympathetic or as reluctant as we may think um because you seem to be thoroughly enjoying drinking the blood <laughs> you know it would be fascinating to show this film to somebody who had no idea what was going to happen no idea that there's this vampire element because in yeah. those early scenes with caleb and may yeah is that quite and, you know, there's that air of him, well, you know, he stops the car, he wants her yeah. to kiss him, you know, that kind of aggressive yeah. air to him, isn't it? Yeah. W which then gets, obviously... It gets turned on its head, and she yeah. does that. You're right. And again, those are really key scenes for me, is that it's actually, and again, because I've watched this film a lot, <laughs> I, off, I somehow those things stand out to me a lot more about him, is actually going, no, I, he is really unpleasant or, or, manip or manipulative, or at least you know out for himself yeah. you know he you know he wants her to kiss him he takes the keys he refuses to drive her home like these are things particularly in the in our contemporary landscape increasingly you know we would look at this and go no this is not acceptable behavior um and i but i think so i think they're playing with that and those moans moments in the car you know he is the sexual predator until that's overturned <laughs> mm. and i think that's a really nice big low moment <laughs> 
Yeah, I also like the lasso scene where he yeah. kind of snares her, but yeah. she's stronger than him. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly. Like too. Yeah. yeah, and it's nice because it's one of those things that you can not really pick up on as well. It's quite subtly done. It's, again, it's one yeah. of the, you know you watch it a couple of times and realize no, actually, yeah, he thinks he's he thinks he's in control and he has no control um, in these scenes. Yeah. So so with May then so appears very innocent. I think she's eating an ice cream essentially when we yeah. first see her. Um, so. In the book, you sort of mentioned the sort of femme fatale tradition with her in that she doesn't look like she's kind of luring him in, but she doesn't look like a classical femme fatale. She yeah. has that kind of androgynous quality, which is often associated with some of Bigelow's characters, like yeah. um, Jamie Lee Curtis's character in Blue Steel, yeah. for instance. Yeah, I think she I mean, I think, you know, that first scene, she is she's a lure for him and it's a very crafted introduction she walks out on the street she's eating ice cream she's bathed in light yeah. um you know that you know she's she, she's there she's a hook for someone to take and he's the one who takes the bite um and so i do compare you know i think it, it has just strong elements of femme fatale because she's using her sexuality so she's acting innocent but she knows what she's doing um but at the same time you know she has that androgynous childlike quality um that is very big low she also, if you think of her compared to kind of the femme fatales in the vampire genres, she doesn't remotely conform to how those characters would look in traditional vampire films, even very, you know, contemporaneous ones. You know, she is she is very kind of tomboyish and, you know, androgynous, and she just undermines those conventions um, the, of the voluptuous female vampire is hypersexual. She mm. is, she's sexualized, but in, not in a very physical way and much more in terms of her identity. Like it's less about how she looks um, and much more about just how she exudes a kind of confident sexuality as, as the character develops. She also has that kind of, I don't know how you describe it, kind of a um, kind of sensuality about the world, you yes. know, where she's like, like, listen to the night, <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but then she also seems to really kind of she's very accepting of her need to kill she seems to enjoy that roadhouse slaughter yeah you know i and it's one of the things i find really interesting about the character is that on the one hand she does talk about like you said the sensuality of the night she talks about still being around in a million years and the lights and the stars reaches the earth like yeah. she she's the you know that as a vampire she is she is interested in more than the kill like she is interested in what this world allows her to experience but she she a, a basic level accepts that killing is what she needs to do to survive. She does it. She doesn't hesitate. As you said, she enjoys, you know, the Rota slaughter. She is fine with it. Um, and like I said, because I did a lot of close analysis, you know, you see her smiling. She's often the backdrop, but she doesn't look horrible. Like, you know, she's not being depicted as reluctant, um, even if she's going along with it. So I quite like that mix. So she's very sympathetic, but she also just accepts this is who she is so it makes her very morally complicated and, and that relationship between the two of them is complicated isn't it because i hadn't thought of this until i read it in the book but there's the scene where he feeds on her yeah so there's obviously the associations with them as lovers but also she's kind of like mothering him absolutely yeah. yeah no absolutely she's feeding him and and it's again very self-consciously structured that sequence where she is literally feeding him from his wrist so she is and he kind of crawls up there's a, like they're they're composed in a very mother, maternal childlike pose of him feeding from her wrist but as the sequence progresses and you get the kind of breathe their breathing escalating and the music you know it's also highly sexualized like and they both there's a kind of climax at the end of, as, as they finally he stops drinking like you see them both kind of exhilarated by this experience and and obviously these are ideas that are inherent in the vampire that kind of duality of of drinking as being something that is both kind of familial and sexual um, i think that's why vampires are really they're interesting because they complicate all those kind of they break those taboos. I think if there are, if there are listeners who haven't seen the film or haven't seen it for a long time and they're listening to some of these descriptions of the scenes, they might be surprised to hear that um, there was some criticism of Near Dark for kind of evoking conservative values. Yes. Is that right? And yes. I, mean, I think what you argue in the book is that it is actually potentially disrupting those values. But yes. to begin with, what were the sort of charges that were le- leveled against the film? I think for all the things we've been talking about, um, that there is a sense where it, it's coming out of the 1980s. So if you put it in a context, 1980s, which is um, 
coming out. It's late eighties, so it's post AIDS crisis. It's not post AIDS, but it's po- it's post globally recognized AIDS crisis. You know, it's at a point where now, you know, everyone's very familiar with this, um, and everyone's very aware. So anything to do with with sexualized exchange of blood is obviously highly interpretable on those lines. Um, So in one respect, the fact that they even suggest a cure to vampirism um, is a sense trying to say, no, there's a way of, no, we we want to now, rather than have these characters engage in this illicit sexuality, we're going to try to cure them, to purify them. Um, So that's one element that's kind of often read as being quite conservative, this idea of somehow even evoking a notion of a cure. Um, but the other thing is that it's, you know, it's a kind of decade of return to family values. And what you have in this narrative is, you know, Caleb comes from a broken family. So it's just him, his sister and his father. Um, K- uh, May comes from this kind of complete vampire family. But in this narrative, which involves um, May choosing between her vampire family and Caleb, she kind of restores the nuclear family. And that what you have is a kind of heteronormative narrative at the end. They're cured of their illicitness and sexuality and um, the family is restored. And that's often how it's read. And, and, I, and I understand that reading. I, I do understand that reading. It has that element of it. Um, I do offer a counter reading um, because I think that it, I think that there is it's not that you, you know, I, I accept that that understanding of it, but I think that Bigelow and Red problematize that in their conception. Uh, and largely around May is that, you know, if you think of this narrative pivoting on her, to her choice between her vampire, her life as a vampire and joining Caleb, is that it's how you read the ending and whether or not you see the ending as a happy ending. You know, is this a good thing? that she is being pulled from one world to the other. Arguably not by choice. She chooses to save Caleb and his sister. But, you know, it's arguable whether or not she chooses to give up being a vampire, yeah. you know. And and I think there's there's that last shot. Again, well, we're spoiling anyways. But, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, the last shot, I think, is, is a very meaningful shot because it doesn't end on her and Caleb running off into the sunshine, all happy and and happy with this resolution, which was in the original script, is that they would go out into the sun and you would have them being very romantic and frolicking in the sunshine. Um, it ends on a freeze frame. And I think that freeze frame for me is, is she look, you know, is interpretable. And I think you can interpret, I, for me, I always find it really uncomfortable that this is not necessarily a, a, ha- a good thing from her. And she looks more afraid in that moment than um, happy about it. She, she, you see, get a sense of her being happy with her cure. Yeah, yeah that's how it seemed to me on, on the most recent viewing. The fact that you get the suspended image with the freeze frame. It made yeah. me think of like the ending of the 400 blows. <laughs> you know, you kind of yeah. that liminal moment. Yeah. Um, but then it sounded like on Catherine Bigelow's commentary, and I think recorded several years yeah. afterwards, but she sounded like it maybe is kind of hopeful, like maybe they can have it all. Yeah. Maybe their love now doesn't have to be mired in this very yeah. dark situation. Yeah, no, she does, you know, and absolutely. She has, she, the way she talks about it is yeah. she does sort of go with that restoration of normality and the heteronormativeness of it. If she's not using that words and she's not saying it, negatively yeah. um i'm just slightly cautious a i think once the film's out there i think she ended it that way <laughs> you know like it, it i think the ending to me isn't hopeful i think it's open to interpretation yeah um and despite what she said because i've listened to that and i've seen her write in other interviews yeah. and that's fine but i think what's interesting is the fact that this is a, a director particularly at that point in her career is highly influenced by douglas sark and we all kind of know there's that long history of Cirque having those false endings, that kind of false happy ending. And to me, one can read this ending very much in the line of that, that it's it's somehow giving you a happy ending, but it's it's throwing dust up into the narrative in the way that Laura Mulvey would say, you know, it's complicating that. Um, but also the fact that in the there's a big difference between how she this this scene is shot and how it was originally conceived in the screenplay. Um, which not only included Caleb and and May going off and being very happy, it included 
the image of the sister Sarah being t- re- the realization that she's turned into a vampire. And so that there was always something in that original screenplay that had a sense of we're going to undermine the hope. And if you look at some of the production stills from the film, you do see images of Sarah with blood marks on her neck with su- suggesting so that there was they were just they were thinking about that i don't know why they well, i i've not i've not found any evidence whether they shot anything other than these production stills um and she doesn't talk about why they changed at least i haven't found anything about why they changed the ending but there is a sense okay that they were thinking about disruptions to that happy ending not necessarily providing a clear-cut happy ending so even yeah. though she says that i still think there's <laughs> evidence you're going well it's a little more complicated um, and I think yeah. as a viewer, it's complicated, regardless of what the director says. Yeah, of course. I mean, she only made the film. <laughs> We're the ones who are sat there watching it. You know? Well, exactly. And I think, you know, and I think, and I, but I, that's why I accept the conservative reading as well, because it, I do think that it's open to interpretation and I accept that reading. It's just never yeah. how it sat with me, where I always just feel really uncomfortable with that last shot. And I'm, and I welcome that discomfort that I think, yeah. no. She did kill, she spent five years killing people. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be for her to reconcile herself back into kind of daily, normal human life. Like, I think yeah. it's complicated. Maybe I spend too much time thinking about these things, no. which is possible. <laughs> um, just finally, on, on the Douglas Sirk comparison they yeah. make, which is a fascinating one. So, so kind of the idea that um, you get these things along the way, character yeah. moments, little yeah. little touches. Um, so I think one of the ones you point to is the fact that in some ways that vampire family is kind of more harmonious than the actual human yeah. family. You know, yeah. they're sat there, they're playing cards at one point, yeah. you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And the other family have that quite awkward dinner as yeah. well in the in the house. Yeah, exactly. I think they're disrupted. I think she's, they're playing an interesting way with notion of families, which I think is really interesting coming out of the 1980s that you do have the, the fully complete uh, you know, nuclear family and the vampire family. There is a mother, there is a father, there are three kids. You know, they are like, you know, and I think to have them be the monster family is itself a commentary on kind of family values because they they seem to embody that. And the humans are are dis- dysfunctional. Now one can read, again, read that really negatively, you know, to suggest that a, a motherless family is going to be just, you know, dysfunctional. Whereas the other family are harmonious but again there's something just the contrast by the fact that you're playing with this idea of these mirror families is 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 shows wanting a desire to disrupt all of those as well as perhaps conform in some ways okay so i actually think over the last hour or so we've uh, kind of raked this one over <laughs> pretty thoroughly stacy unless right. there's anything else you wanted to say about near dark in particular no, I mean, I could always talk about it, but I think we've covered all the, the kind of big the bases, yeah. bases, covered all the bases. Is there anything you'd like to point listeners to in terms of, I don't know, perhaps social media presence or anything like that? Well, I'm on Twitter, um, which is sort of at Stacey Abbott, are you? Uh, and that's about it. I guess that's probably the most likely place to find me. Okay. And um, I'll just say that, as I said earlier, I really enjoyed um, your book on Near Dark, Stacey. I think it's a great addition to the BFI Film Classics series, and it's been a pleasure to to talk about it with you today. If listeners want to find me, I'm on Twitter at CKJ Sweeney. Um, that's all, though, for this podcast episode, which, as I said at the beginning, uh, is designed to tie in with the new review of Film and Television Studies uh, special issue on Catherine Bigelow. Um, I hope you enjoyed the issue. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.